to cut my own shafts and my golf clubs using good hickory, but then I tried bamboo as a material. And a friend of mine suggested right promptly that I would uh, get in touch with Dr. Holden because he made fly rods and had written a book about it and he gave me the idol of split bamboo. And he gave me quite a lot of pointers about making bamboo rods and how much pleasure it was. He also showed me what real Tonkin cane looked like. And then I was interested to get started making a fly rod. <laughs> well, our problem is to make seven foot rods and at random we'll pick this stalk here, which looks to be adequate fibers for a seven foot rod. We have here a piece of bamboo which has been in storage in the attic since before World War II and thoroughly seasoned. And it's time of putting it in storage. We started a split and carried that split above the first node and almost to the second node. Now the shrinkage when seasoning is very apt to pull that apart and with a good start it might go straight up the stalk. Now we are going to split this bamboo at a point where we will have two equal halves. We have to mark it so that we will get a split perpendicular to the fibers. <clears throat> we have now rotated our bamboo so if the check split is down and the mark at the midpoint is up. We place our cleaver in the split first and on the mark. Then we tap this quite lightly. And we start to see that split starting going up about two inches. Now that indicates that we have solid fiber in this lower piece. The, are completing the second split in this by the, using the cam action of two two splitters. They're very effective. Now we've gone that split the full length of the stalk and probably have the same amount of fiber on both sides of the new split. these diaphragms out. It's essential to come out on the sides first, then clear up the middle. If you did try to take it all out and run in the middle, you'd probably split your bamboo through the middle. Damn, that doesn't work right. We're now splitting one half of the stalk into three pieces of about equal width. I have right through. Ooh. The only difference from rod to rod, if you make them accurately, is the uh, temper of the bamboo fibers that are in the stock from which the rod is made. Therefore, if you want two rods absolutely matched, it would be very advisable to make them from the same stock of bamboo. cutting and splitting this into pieces useful for pieces for one rod. We have 
split one half of our stalk into six pieces nearly equal width. So we mark off for our tips. And they've got piece number one, number five, and three, six, two, and four. We have, however, some obvious decay on the very surface. We're going to do a little filing on this spot that looks like decay to see how deep it goes into the bamboo and whether it should be put into the rod. It doesn't look it. It goes right across the whole strip. So this bottom half of this number one piece, we cannot use. We're going to mark the nodes in red. And we have marked these pieces for their position of rotation in the finished joint. Nodes are very hard, but below the nodes where the old fibers are thinning out and above where the new fibers are taking hold, you have weak spots in the cane as a whole, and you want to get those separated. This is the cutoff mark for number one piece. The butt material lies there, tip material above it. We have here one of the butt strips, or strip for a butt. We got kind of thick. Clean the sum of the pith off the inside and prepare it or just putting it accurately. Now we're trying to get from this piece from which he planed the pith two pieces. We now start to take the lip off of the exterior side of all these strips. I don't know exactly what to say to the beginner who wants an exact description of what a good piece of cane is. But I'd simply say that if it is green and soft and he can bend a piece of it and it stays bent, I don't think I'd want to make a rod of it. <laughs> I've been admiring your rod so much I missed a trout over there. He came up and rolled at it. I was concentrating on watching that beautiful action. Oh, that is beautiful to feel. Get enough line out on this. Yeah, get well, this. we have to watch our back cast. I felt a little piece of brush in back of me. That is a yeah. delight to hold, Gary. Uh, this. And a dream to cast. Okay, we're taking the remaining bend out of this piece up here. We got a little kick in there. A double kick, which goes this way. That's going to be nasty, <laughs> as old Bill said. You heat it over an alcohol flame until you can feel with your fingers that bamboo is soft enough to be displaced and the bend comes out. It always comes back in. Not yet, not yet. Where is it? Now flatten out the surface at those nodes and get them smooth so that they coincide with the outside of bamboo. Now having these straightened out, watch the reflection of light on that. 
you don't want to file it any further than is necessary. Now that is the last operation we do before beginning our bevel cutting. We bevel cut these six strips into equilateral triangles and assemble them with the densest fibers on the outside. And when glued, these pieces will form a true hexagon, which is the shape of the rod for its entire length. We're cutting now on the wooden form. One side of the strip only will be cut. Then we will cut them on the short steel forms. Both sides will be cut until you have a triangular section flush with the top of the steel forms. We switch to a heavier plane. pass of a file, we are taking off the sharp edges on the very exterior side of the strip. The reason for that is that the sharp edge, in being collected on your binder, will not cut your binding cord because we later bind these together with the other five pieces in preparation for heat treating. And in starting that, the rod rotates, putting a good tension on the cord that's binding it together. This binder is something I developed quite a few years back. It works fairly well. Carry your winding right down to the end, at which point the cord will let go of it. Hold your cord. Arms work. Cut it enough four half hitches around the on in the direction of the winding. Now we must reverse the direction of the feed so as they get a cross winding on this and overcome any twists in the rod which the first winding put in. Again, we put the binding thread in under the entering cord of the belt binder. Both these tips and the butt ready for heat treating. The heat treating drives off surplus moisture and also evaporates some of the lighter oils which have a tendency to keep your fibers soft so that you've got a greater density of fiber in the finished rod than you started with. At 10.02 exact. Mm-hmm. She dropped in temperature rather quickly. One minute, 45 seconds. We roll them side for side. Three minutes, 30 seconds. At 3.50 we are. We turn these end for end. Five minutes, 30 seconds. Tips out. Seven minutes, butts out. That's the works. All flame is gone.
These are plating forms are set for a specific rod. Still very nice, but just happened some hired help one time, couldn't find a crowbar on the property and used it for such. So I have to just lay a little wedge under that end to keep it from moving. Now these screws are a differential screw in such that one complete turn of that screw will open or close this screw eight thousandths of an inch. Beginning our final cutting with the first pass on this one strip of bamboo. We'll plant it in a manner to force the uh, rind of this against uh, the form. gradually work into the taper that we want to attain at the final stages. Now we change our planes. And I'll continue planing until I no longer pick up any material. Now we've got this strip Laying down as far as we can get it in the preliminary side of the forms. And our cutting is fairly clean. We'll turn the forms over to the finished side, where the groove is much smaller. We'll have to change our plane and take a final, finer cut on this side. This cutting has got to be very careful. We're now going to <coughs> remove from this one strip the outside enamel. And the purpose of that is to see the fibers as they are and detect any further injury or imperfection Well, that blade vibrated a little bit coming down over the length. I didn't detect it until it got down to the end. They have a little chips in there. They won't be deep. We got to get them out. They're about ready to make the last pass at planing to the finished side. We've got to take a very fine cut. That's the second side. Now that we have this strip cut down to the steel, our beveling of the strip is finished. I think of a lecture that was given by Professor Este at the Union College in the fall of 1913. And he demonstrated wave linear action. And he had a horse whip there, or rather a carriage whip, which he vibrated. And you could see the same width of amplitude all the way down to the end. And that meant that he had to maintain a higher stress at the point by reducing the diameter of his whip. We all know how easy it is to knock a fly off a horse's ear, at least we kids did when we were youngsters. <laughs> we have these pieces assembled in rotation and we have taped them together at various points to hold them in a relative position. These are all tape. The tape has been slit, and they are 
lying flat and ready to be glued. So we'll prepare our glue right now. That's the resourceful rosin, is a dark wine-colored liquid. And you buy it off the counter in the hardware store as Elmer's waterproof glue. But in making a bonding material for the strips of a fly rod, I suggest that instead of using one part uh, by weight, one part of powder, two or parts of plastic glue, and mixing it, I would suggest that you mix it one-fifth of powder and 15% of your weight of your plastic in alcohol. The purpose of the alcohol is to thin the glue down and, and make it more pliable and at the same time act as a penetrating agent to carry that glue into the fibers of the bamboo. After your glue has set for 24 hours, you remove the binding cord with the aid of this brass pipe. <clears throat> when I remove the excess, excess glue from the faces of the rods, and you must be careful not to cut your corners. It comes off very easily. You're using a, a well-worn 10-inch mill bastard file. And we do the same thing with the tips. Twist in my Ooh. This is the point where your headaches and your come and your patience is tried to the limit. <clears throat> You've got to locate twists in this rod gluing, if any occur. Now, what I failed to mention before was that on the hand grass of my rods, there is no taper. The action of the taper, taper ends there, and there is a swell from about this point to the end of the hand grass. It's a peculiar thing, but that usually produces a twist in the rod. Now, let's see if we have it. We saw that move, and the twist is in the rod, so we'll mark it to get it out. And the length of it is from there where it starts to there where it stops. Now, we check some twists in this rod downstairs. We'll bring it up here and warm it over this alcohol flame and see if we can work them out. Let her go that time. Also have a bend in there. But that twist is corrected. Cut our rod joint off to length in the back end, and we've got a mount of block on here for the butt cap. And we face the back end of that off. Now we're going to trim this down so it'll take this prepared block, which will hold the butt cap of the rod. All right, we put this block on that takes the butt cap. We'll now cut cork with holes to fit the front of the rod we're working on. Now we'll slide these cork down on the rod, leaving a space to get behind them and force them on home. When 
now preparing our glue for pasting on the cork. And we use the same mixture for attaching the ferrules. And there are two different epoxies. And the reason that I have found that these two epoxies set up with a slight expansion. We put a little of this mixture on each cork. And then we force it home. <clears throat> this procedure gives you a solid hand grasp and drill seat. And get a perfect control of your rod. Well, Gary, I think I pounded that trout down. <laughs> One thing, when I we were down in the shop working, mm -hmm. Something I've been meaning to ask you is the balance of a rod and the line. That one balances so beautifully. Anywhere in about here. It makes for such ease of casting. When That's it because you're, you're twisting your hand to drive the bending in the rod right at that point. The properly designed ferrule will take the, the bending power, power delivered from the butt section to the tip. These ferrules of Mr. Fire Ovens are made of nickel silver, hard drawn nickel silver tubing. There is no step down of diameter inside of the ferrule. We must fit this part of the rod to fit the inside of our ferrule. First of all, we'll take a depth gauge and measure how far that ferrule must enter and mark this rod with pencil. And that is where the serration must come to when we seat the ferrule. Now then, we take the end of the serrations and put another mark. From here to here, we turn it to fit the inside of the ferrule. And then we feather these corners on the hex so that the transition from the hex to the round meets that point. Now we'll take down the marks on that where the ferrule is bearing too hard with a very fine sandpaper. We'll put the ferrule on there and see how she bears. She's tight and she goes all the way home. Now then we got to get that off of there. We have a pair of blocks to take a hold of it and pull it back but she'll go home. That's a fit. That is a fit. We're now ready to put the ferrule on the rod, except we've got to get the binding solution down in the ferrule itself. You fit the serrations. The cut for the serration, rather, will be in the center of the flat. We can still get them there. And binding them down, they will fold right over and stay put. Okay, now we bind it. We got this nylon cord under tension and we're rewrapping it the second time around these serrations. We got to get well up and then tie it fast. Oh, got too much there. I've noticed you make your handles, your grips, all just about parallel. What is the taper on? Well, it's a very slight taper, about a sixteenth to a thirty-second to a sixteenth of an inch. Using a very coarse bastard file, we'll turn this and get the cork down more or less an even size.
still very rough turning we're doing now. Our rail seat has to come down a little. We have a very slight slope in this hand grasp between the back end and the front end. I tried to make the grip one thirty second of it greater diameter at the top end than at the bottom end. You just take your hand and close it. Ever played baseball? If you milked a cow, it probably closed that way. We're going to <clears throat> sight through these ferrules and see how the alignment of the rod is through the ferrules. And then select, in so doing, we'll select the side that the guides go on. And a little kick there. You want to distribute your load when the line is in tension at a great many points on your rod, they approach what you might call uniform loading. Now, you don't have, you can't have too many guys in the rod. You can hey, load it down the guys, but the weight of these guys do add a little weight to the rod. But they must be of a caliber that the torsion in the top of that guide in no way affects the bending quality of the rod. This is a very trivial operation, but quite frequently these guys have little burrs on the end of the feet. Makes quick work of your winding silk. Now we see how she go on. You wind one foot of your guide really tight. And uh, pull the winding thread through the last eight turns of the winding. Go on down to the next guide and complete, complete putting your guides on. Then you come back up the rod from the foremost guide to the last guide here. And then you look through your guides and see where they are relative to that top guide. May have a twist here and there, or a guy leans or off one side, and that's due to the inaccuracy of the surface of the rod. The uh, spiral of this winding is in the opposite direction from the spiral put on at first. One winding will neutralize the effect of putting a twist in the rod. We will use an alcohol flame to singe these silk windings. And with all silk thread, there is a, the ends of the fibers do stick out. And when you 
Put your varnish over the windings, it will be clear and flat. Otherwise, you'd have a rough surface on that winding. These varnishing tanks are enclosed within this covering. And uh, at the bottom, we have electric light bulbs for heating if it is colder than necessary. And they extend up through the ceiling where we have drilled holes in the floor to drop them through. the dip varnishing because of one solid reason and that is that you have an equal surface tension on all six sides of the rod. The speed of withdrawal must be governed by the balance between this surface tension and the adhering qualities of the varnish. Now what we have to do before we start that up again is to blow the diaphragm of varnish out of those guys or else they would later roll down and give us a tear and that's something we wish to avoid. The butt has come out first to remove that from the tank. Not too bad. I put four coats on the rod. With a varnish, it'll take 24 hours before you put your next coat on. With a polyurethane, you've got to get the next coat on in less than 12 hours. Now with a <clears throat> butt cap in place and drilled for this pin, we drive the pin through. attractive and look better, we will just simply take very fine pumice and oil and break the gloss of the finish on the rod. Now we'll take what varnish is adhered to the guide and cut it off with this so that the uh, guide will be clean and will not, varnish will not cut the line. Now this is the very last thing we do to a rod before we take it out and put it to work. Boy, this is beautiful. <laughs> oh! Went over the rock that Join time. Join the club, Jerry, I'm with you. <laughs> this makes me want my youth back again. We could be young men with old trout to battle with, we'd be happy again, wouldn't we? 